Gillespie, Chair of the Southboro Open Space Preservation Commission. And I'd like to welcome you here to today's presentation on behalf of the Town of Southboro. You'll note a questionnaire on your seat. Please wait to the end of the presentation to fill it out. We're hoping some of your answers may change based on the information you're going to get today. And um, first of all, what's the bus? This presentation came out of conversations at meetings of members of the Metro West Conservation Alliance. I'd like to introduce Laura Matei, the Director of Stewardship at Sudbury Valley Trustees, who's here to tell you a bit about the MCA. I'm Laura Matei of the Sudbury Valley Trustees is a regional land trust in 36 communities west of Boston working to protect and steward lands. And we support the uh, Metro West Conservation Alliance, which is a collaboration of local land trusts, local commissions and municipalities, and some other uh, nonprofit organizations and agencies, all working together in this region to promote good land protection and good land stewardship. Thank you, Laura. So, what is the uh, Native Pollinator Task Force? Well, we were formed during discussions of members of the MCA who were sharing their concerns about the status of pollinators and native bees. And um, this presentation is the beginning of our educational programming. There will be many more programs and events coming up. And you may be wondering about the 30,000 acres of non-conservation land managed as pollinator habitat. That's a lot of backyards. <laughs> How are we going to reach that? <coughs> one plant at a time, one yard at a time, one garden at a time. How we landscape matters. So I'd like to introduce you to the task force that we have right now. You can see we come from a very wide geographic area and we represent many different um, entities throughout the watershed, 36 communities. If the task force members could stand up, just wave. So, at the end of the um, presentation, there'll be questions and then after that, when you're mingling and getting ready to leave, if you have questions, you can go up to one of them. We have name tags so you can find us, hopefully. And here's some of our upcoming planned events. In um, this winter, we're going to have a how-to how -to toolkit. Um, presenting information. We'll have a presentation, you know, describing how you can do gardening and what to be looking for for healthy habitat. And then next summer, this is the biggie. We're planning to have a region-wide throughout the 36 communities of the watershed, a native plant garden tour. Um, this is going to take some effort, and certainly if you're willing to have a, if you have a garden already that's predominantly or mostly natives, we have also like blended gardens where people have added native skin, um, weaving the natives into the pre-existing gardens, um, but also pure native gardens are what we're hoping to find some and create more and more. So this garden tour, we're looking for gardens, but we're also going to look for people to help us plan and institute that because 36 towns, it's a large region and um, we're going to need everyone's help working together. Because we're not just looking at creating a network of landscapes and gardens, but also a network of people. Working together, we can accomplish much. So, it is now my honor to introduce Dr. Robert Jagir. I first met Dr. Jagir at a workshop in 2015. Beyond the honeybee, we're worried about the wrong bees. He put his uh, contact information on the handout, so when I got home, I called him up and said, can you come out to Breakneck Hill Conservation Land in Southboro and um, take a look? That's a clue for anyone who's doing work. Always call people. You know, <laughs> lucky for us, one of the first bees that flew by was the rare Bombus fervidus, the first one he had seen that season. And he adopted Breakneck Hill as one of his research sites. This has been a game changer for us. Um, we thought we were doing really A-plus work, managing for pollinators. We had pollinator gardens, 
you know, we had lots of butterflies. We thought we were doing really well. Through the research and the surveys, we learned there was more that could be done. And, and that makes a difference. There was a lot more. We had some gaps in what is needed by our pollinators, even on conservation land that you're managing for pollinators. So um, that's why this presentation and his research is so vitally important. So Dr. Jagir is a professor in the Department of Biology at U of Mass Dartmouth. He received his PhD from Western University in Canada. After completing his PhD, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, Canada. He then moved to U of Mass Medical School, where he was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Neurobiology. Prior to joining U of Mass Dartmouth, he was a professor in the Department of Biology and biotechnology and an adjunct professor in the bioinformatics and computational biology program at WPI. Robert's research focuses on the neuroecology and conservation of plant pollinator interactions. He uses a highly interdisciplinary research approach that integrates concepts and methodologies from evolutionary ecology, psychology, neurobiology, molecular biology, and computer science. His research has been supported by multiple National Science Foundation grants. He has been published in books, prestigious scientific journals, and popular press. Robert created Ecology, a citizen science project, which aims to accelerate biodiversity conservation efforts. Robert was awarded the 2018 Regional Impact Award by the Native Plant Trust formerly the New England Wildflower Society. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert G. Here. Thank you, Freddie. Always good to have pressure put on you right before a talk. <laughs> good thing you're not paying. Hopefully you're not paying. All right. Okay, so let me start by thanking the, the committee for the invitation. Um, South Borough, even though I live in Framingham, South Borough was near and dear to my heart, as Freddie mentioned, uh, because Breakneck Hill was my first study site and remains to be, remains one of my uh, main study sites. Um, it turns out that what's going on at Breakneck is very typical of what's going on um, in other areas of the state at the same elevation. And so, you know, what's, what I found at Breakneck, I've been working there since 2015, um, I've been able to compare it to what I'm seeing at other sites and also breakneck when I try new things to try to, to, to increase diversity, <coughs> particular functional diversity, which I'll talk about um, later on. Um, breakneck is my, my testing ground, and I'd like to thank Freddie for allowing me to, uh, to experiment and try different things. Um, as the title of the talk, the people plant pollinator connection. So there's a lot of talk about pollinators, save the pollinators, and typically people think about save the bees. Um, but what, what I want you to do is, you know, I, the reason that plant and pollinator are on there together, I, I put them on there for a reason. In fact, I would add pollinator, plant, animal connections. So when we talk about pollinators, we're really talking about biodiversity. That, that's the, the main thing, and I think that's, in a lot of what's going on with pollinator decline and conservation, we're, we're missing that point. So I'm really going to hammer that point home. Um, today, uh, and the people part comes in in a couple of ways. First of all, we are clearly uh, affecting biodiversity, affect, affecting pollinators, which in turn affects biodiversity. Um, how we're doing that, you know, we're working, that's where the research comes in to figure out how we're doing things. And also, though, the people are needed to help fix the situation. And, and that can be done in a number of ways, and one way that, um, you know, that, that I hope that you will will help or participate is through the Ecology Project, which Freddie mentioned, the Citizen Science Project. We're in our third year now. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that during our talk. Um, but there are different ways you can help with Ecology. And even though it says Ecology, I'm not just a bee guy. And it's not just about bees. It's about um, these interactions and what are called ecological networks. And so there are a few things that I want you to, to leave here today. First is a greater appreciation of what the problem really is when it comes to pollinators. Um, there are two uh, sides of the same coin. One side's received a lot of attention. That's the agricultural side, which is very important. Um, tends to focus more on the honeybee. And there's a whole other side that's basically been neglected, and that's the ecological side. That's where the biodiversity comes in. 
So we need to do, we can apply the same strategy to both sides, to both sides. <coughs> we need to develop new strategies and really focus on those species that are threatened. So even though they might not be important in agriculture, they're, they're very important for um, biodiversity ecosystem function and ecosystem services. Those are services we get from, from Nature for Free, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, to give you an overview of what I want to talk about today, I thought what I want to do is, and what I'm doing or trying to do is to bring science into pollinator conservation, biodiversity conservation. So everything I have plant lists, the things that I do and the things that I tell people to do are all based on data that I can, sh I, I, I've done different experiments, comparative studies and surveys that I know when I tell you to do something that it's going to have a positive effect. And, and this is, this is the, the scientific process. And the, the citizen science, what I'm really trying to do with citizen science, uh, a lot, there are a lot of citizen science projects out there and it's a lot about data collection. Send me your data. I want to take it one step further and I want you to become the expert and the scientist. I want you to be able to go to your property and for you to be able to assess that property for how um, eco-friendly it is, how much biodiversity you're supporting, do you have threatened species, and if you don't, what, what do you have to think? What am I going to do? Or how can I change things so I can help these threatened species? So you can do a pre-assessment, you can do a change, and then you can do a post-assessment. And that's effectively what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm doing a um, before-after type experiment across the state to try to, to see how things, what impact these, these changes make. And really, I, I, I've met a number of people that really put the science into, into citizen science. And, and I'm hoping that you will, I, I will help you um, move in that direction. I give workshops on, on Bumblebee ID, but it's not just about the bumblebees, it's about everything else and how we can appreciate and, and, and um, identify biodiversity and, and areas of the ecosystem that are in trouble and, and, and how, how is it we're going to help it. So I'm gonna start by, uh, um, start by defining the problem. So what types of data do we need? Obviously the problem is, you know, our pollinators, our plants, biodiversity in general is, is, um, is dropping at an alarming rate worldwide. Um, so why is, it, why is it doing that? What, what, is cause, what are we doing to cause this rapid decline? So that's where the collecting and analyzing data comes in. So helping us to identify what's going on. Um, we, we figure out what the mechanism is. And then from there, the next step. So a lot of, we're really caught up in this is, as academics, you know, working on, on bees or really stop at figuring out what's going on ecologically and we miss this last step which is the most important. That is how do we take data and create these effective conservation strategies. Um, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to come in and, and tell us what to do and that's not necessarily the best thing to do. So you really want to make sure that there's a connection between data and, and these solutions and that's, that's what I'm trying to promote and that's what I'm, I'm trying to do with, with my research and also with, with the ecology which is sort of a, a subset of my research report. It's helping me to move my research program um, forward. So to start then, I mentioned that it's, it's not, we hear about pollinators, but it's not really about pollinators in terms of the animal. So when we hear pollinator, we think of um, the animal, typically it's a bee, and if it's a bee, typically it's a honeybee. Because that's what we've heard since 2006, right? With colony collapse of our honeybees, and, and bees are clearly very important when it comes to agriculture, but bees are not, any more important than other things visiting flowers when it comes to, to ecology. Um, so, so pollinator then is really a plant-based term. It's not an animal-based term. You have to think about the plant. The animal is, is giving the plant or helping the plant to do something, and that something is reproduction. So plants, like animals, need to reproduce, but plants, unlike animals, can't run around to find a mate. Right? So they have their male gametes, and then you get those male gametes to um, the female reproductive structure where we get fertilization taking place. So that's a, that's a significant problem. How do you get your gametes to find the proper individual? Right? Um, and so here we're talking about pollen. Think of that as the male gametes, and then the stigma is the female part. We get the pollen tube growing, get fertilization taking place, and we get development. If the pollen is transferred to the female part of um, a flower, either the same flower or flower on the same plant, what happens is that the plant's effectively mating with itself. So although some plants can do that, um, giving your pollen to another individual that isn't related 
is, is a, a much better option when it comes to reproductive success. It's the same reason that there are laws against us mating with our relatives. What happens is that you get in there a number of, this is more of a genetic reason rather than a social reason, so there are many reasons. Why they're not. <laughs> the, the, the social doesn't apply to plants, I don't think. But um, anyway, genetically speaking, what you get is um, inbreeding depression, so you, there's, you're more likely to get um, combinations that would negatively affect your offspring. Which is, which is what you don't want to do. Uh, going back to this figure, you can see that, that the pollen just has to fall, so you could shape the, the flower and the pollen would fall, and you would get that type of selfing occurring. Um, plants have a wide variety of strategies, which I'm not going into, to mate. So some flowers have male and female parts. Some plants have male and female flowers on the same plant. There are male and female plants. So you know that's a course in itself. Um, the main point is that they want to minimize selfing, so half plant species are, are selfing compatible. Um, those that are do better when they transfer their pollen to another plant. This process is called outcrossing. Now, if the pollen goes to the female reproductive structure of another species, two things happen, two reproductive costs. You're effectively wasting gametes on another species, that's why we have a lot of Again, uh, laws against mating with other species, but it's not going to work. You're not going to get offspring doing that. Also, that's a cost from the male perspective. And what happens is that the foreign pollen blocks the surface of the stigma. And when the um, pollen from the same species come, there's no place for it to attach because it's been taken up by that foreign pollen. And so there is less fertilization. And that's a cost from the female perspective. So the plants, you know, there's strong selection pressure for plants to maximize this outcrossing because that's where they get the greatest reproductive benefit. And this has been going on for, for many, um, you know, billions of years. This outcrossing, so if we do get outcrossing leading to this fertilization event, that is called pollination. That process of, of transfer is called pollination. If I get pollen transfer, so let's say I have an individual pollen moving from here to here, this is not pollination, it's, a co it's costly. So right away we can separate a flower visitor from a pollinator. Right? The, um, the vast majority of plants require or, or use animals to help them to move pollen to the proper plant to the proper donor, or sorry, recipient. Some plants use the wind, some plants use water, but the problem with that is it's very inefficient, right? If the wind's blowing this way, my mate's this way, I'm in trouble, right? If the stream's this way, and I put my pollen in the water, and I want to mate this with somebody up here, it's very inefficient. And so the animal helps to target the, the pollen transfer, and that's why the vast majority of flying plants use animals for reproduction. Those animals that help are, are um, classified as pollinators. So when we look at flowering plants, worldwide there are about 300,000 flowering plant species, the vast majority of which are animal pollinated. Okay? And the animals that, that perform that function, notice I've called them flower visiting animals at this point, there are many animals that visit flowers not to help plants to reproduce, but to, to help them to reproduce, or sorry, to, help, to, to get food. The food is in the form of nectar, pollen, and, and other things as well, oils in some cases. Um, for the most part, we're looking at nectar and, and pollen if, if your um, um, pollen is a source of protein and nectar is a source of carbohydrate. So this postage stamp shows you the different animals that may be visiting flowers for food, that depend on flowers for food for survival. And you can see we've got a small mammal here, a bat, and a hummingbird. That's um, three out of seven or eight. Um, in reality, of the 200,000 known species, only 1,000 are vertebrates. So the vast majority of what we need, or the plants need, and the relationships that plants have are with insects. All right? We see that we have our, our wasp here, we've got our bumblebee, we've got beetles and flies and butterflies and moths. All of these are important, um, equally important at some level over here. But what I want you to realize is that this is just a representation. This single bumblebee represents 4,000 species in North America alone. It isn't, um, not only are there different species, there are different types, and, and, and um, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, there isn't a single animal of the 200,000, there isn't a single animal on this side that can pollinate everything on this side, and there isn't a single plant on this side that can provide food for um, everything on this side. What happens is, again, the reason we have so much diversity here and here is because they form these special relationships with one another. And so subsets of animals on this side are important and visit food and pollinate a subset on this side. And that's what we start to see. It's not this free-for-all where um, everything here is looking for food and we'll visit anything here. There's, there's what's called preference. There are these specialization, these specialized systems. Um, 
if we break things down a little bit more, as I mentioned, that single bumblebee represents 4,000 bees. That's, those are things like our carpenter bees, the, the solitary bees, you know, 4,000 species in North America. Then we have moss and butterflies that are also important. So there are native plants that we have that are butterfly pollinated. So even if you had all these, the plant wants butterflies. So we need to give them butterflies, right? There are fly pollinated plants. There are wasps even play a role in pollination as well. There are beetles that are important pollinators. There's a beetle covered in pollen. And I think that these animals get overlooked, and not only do they play an important role from the plant's perspective in, in helping native plants reproduce, but we'll see that they are an important foundation to support wildlife and other trophic levels. So those flies that we want to get rid of and we don't care about when we spray pesticides are actually pollinating plants that are helping to support birds and small mammals and things that are sexier and that we, we tend to care about more than a little fly that's visiting a flower. And we're going, to, we're going to look at those connections in more detail. So we have all of these animals, and I said that they're visiting a subset. The subset of connections that we have between particular groups of animals and particular groups of native plants, are, we call them collectively a pollination system. So we need to move away from using the term pollinator, and I would much rather we replace it with pollination system, because that implies that there are multiple players. In fact, we can we will see that we're going to increase that to pollination network or ecological network, where we not just we don't just have the pollinator and plant as and that codependent, but we have other animals that are using that plant and depend on that interaction for survival and the idea of keystone species. So to give you an example, here's a hummingbird pollinated plant species, and you can see that here's the pollen. The hummingbird comes in, the nectar, it's looking for nectar that's located down at the base of the flower. The hummingbird comes in and it hits its forehead. The pollen is it picks up the pollen. And then it, it, uh, the reason that the plant has evolved this mechanism is because if it deposited the pollen anywhere else, let's say it deposited on the wings, it would be very inefficient. It would lose a lot of gametes doing that. So there's strong selection for the plant to put it on the animal in a place where the animal's not going to remove it. Okay? In the case of hummingbirds, they're just looking for nectar. And so the pollen in the forehead, it's very difficult for them to wipe it off. When, the pollen, when, the, when this bird moves to another flower, here's the female part. It moves down into position to get the nectar and scrapes its forehead against the female part, transferring the pollen. All right, so that's a very specialized system. The plant has evolved these special mechanisms to fit, quote unquote, it's, it's the pollinator that's most efficient. Here's a bumblebee system. Bumblebees, a bumblebee pollinated plant. Here's the female part. The male part is other in a different flower inside, inside this flower. But you'll notice that they deposit the pollen on the, um, the upper side of the thorax of the bee. Why? If you ever had uh, an itch in the middle of your back, you can't get it, right? And you'll see bees when they leave flowers, they'll sit on the flower and you'll see them like a cat trying to groom that pollen off because they don't want it there, but they can't get to it. That way, even though they get some of it, and that, that makes them happy because they want it for food, a lot of it gets transferred to another flower and they scrape up against the female part as they go to another flower transferring it. Here's a highly specialized system, a fly with a long tongue. Notice how it fits the two. Here's the pollen sac. So if we don't have this flower, we don't have this fly species, and if we don't have this fly species, we don't have this flower. So we can go from more generalized systems where there are different pollinators that vary in their efficiency, how effective they are as pollinators, how efficient they are at pollen transfer, down to a specialized system where it's a one-to-one. -one. The monarch butterfly. You know, we think monarchs milkweed. Yes, at the larval stage, at the adult stage, monarchs, adult monarchs are visiting a wide variety of things. And some of those, here you can see the pollen on the tongue of this um, plant species. Um, and so this would be a butterfly pollen of plant species. If my hummingbird were to visit this flower, it, would, it, it may, might be able to get the nectar out and never touch and not transfer any pollen. Let's say the pollen on its beak, it would fall off. Therefore, it would be a flower visitor, not a pollinator. And if it did transfer some pollen, it's not as efficient as this bumblebee. So the plant's trying to, what plants are trying to do is filter out those pollinators, take the good ones, and get rid of the bad ones. And so there's a push and pull that's going on, and it's called plant pollinator conflict. And I could spend another hour talking about neuroecology and all of that, and I'll spare you. My voice is going to give anyway, so uh, I'll spare you from that. To give you an example, I always include movies to try to keep people awake. Um, so here's a, a bottle gentian, here's uh, Bombus vegans, which is this, um, a species of concern in the state, one that I'm looking at. So in this bottle gentian, you can see that in order to get the nectar, which is located at the base, the bee has to pry open the petals and crawl inside the flower, and you see it looks like the flower is actually eating the bee, and if I stop it, you can see it's just its legs sticking out, and it gets the nectar. So only about 
uh, 10 to 20 percent of bees, bumblebee workers, actually learn where that nectar is. Most of them can't find it. So it, unlike, you know, in the past people have thought that, that insects are governed by instinct and that they, they know where things are and that's absolutely false. Some have some biases, but for the most part, it's everything's based on learning because the environment, the resource environment is varying over time and space. So it makes sense that they would have some sort of learning and memory and cognitive abilities. So the, from the plant's perspective, why is it that only 10%, why would you exclude so many pollinators? The answer is because for those few bees that get reward and figure out where the reward is here, there's so much reward that they will travel great distances to find another flower with that much reward. And so it's the plant's way of manipulating the pollinator, building up those resources, and it knows that pollinator is going to be faithful and move from plant to flowers of the same species. That's very important, right, from the plant's perspective. So the plants have a wide variety of tricks that they use to, to exploit and manipulate pollinators um, to, to get them to reproduce. So you can think of the brain, the sensory and cognitive system of pollinators as the brain, the plant's brain, really. Right? The, the flowers are there because they exploit those systems to manipulate the pollinators to reproduce, help the plant to reproduce. So effectively they are animals, they just live vicariously through the animals that are visiting them and, and manipulating their, 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 their system. Okay, so we now, hopefully you have a sense of, of what we mean by pollinators. We're going to have a pollination system, which means we're paying attention to the plant and the pollinator. Both are equally important. We're flipping things more, now more to the plant perspective than the, the animal perspective. Both equally important, but you know, native plants are declining. Not surprisingly, the, the pollinators are declining, the plants are declining. If you look at who pollinates them, it's the ones that are declining. But native plants aren't getting as much attention as they should. Again, because of the focus on agriculture, and I'm trying to bring that back, but it's all really about the plant. Right? The pollinator is there to help the plant, but those two are codependent, so they're at the very least equally important. Um, and so we want to we want to start thinking about pollination systems instead of pollinators. So the problem is that many of our pollination systems are in trouble and, and they're being degraded. So certain species are declining. Here, here are um, some data on uh, bumblebees in Massachusetts. And so the, the, one of the things, so you wonder why, why am I focused on bumblebees? One of the reasons, well I love bumblebees, but um, in terms of, um, and you're going to love them too, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, but, the, but bumblebees, unlike other bees, um, we have really good historical data. So I know what was going on here in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and how things have changed. We can't say that for the thousands of other bee species. So the approach there is we're just going to continuously monitor things, but to be honest, they're already probably in trouble, so we might not see the declines as much as we're seeing them in bumblebees. So historical data, this is from you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, before the year 2000 in blue, and current data from across the state, so low elevations below 1,000 feet, high elevations above 1,000 feet. And we can see that in many cases, that the, the, I haven't found any, so Bombus aphanus is on the endangered species list, and Bombus pennsylvanicus down here, or sorry, right here, I haven't been able to find any of those. And many others I've been able to find, and they, they are uh, in rapid decline. So Bombus vagans I talked about, Bombus tricola, and Freddie mentioned Bombus fervidus here, and here, both at high and low elevation. The other thing I want to point out here, though, is that there are many species, so Bombus brisicolis and patients in particular, by Maculatus, where the yellow bar is much, is, is where we're seeing an increase, and also we're seeing an, an expansion of, of their ranges to higher elevations. So this idea that all pollinators are in trouble, it's absolutely false. Some are headed for extinction. Others, whatever we're doing to the environment, they love it, and they're doing better than they have done historically. And so when you look at your, your garden and you see tons of bees and you think, oh, it's great, I've got so many bees, and I hear this all the time, the question is, what species are you seeing? Later in the summer, this Bombus impatiens, I'll go to a, a location and I'll see a thousand, two thousand Bombus impatiens and nothing else, when there should have been four or five other species there. And that has important implications. So we want to move from abundance, the number of things we see, to diversity, which is the number of different kinds of things we see. That's what we need to pay attention to. And so this says right away, we need to target those species in trouble, not just bumblebees in general. Because what's happening is we're putting out plants that are helping those common species that are already doing well, and they're out competing the threatened species. Because their numbers are being built up, the threatened species don't like what we're putting out, and then if once they they overlap and compete, we've got something numbering in the thousands to something that has a handful of workers, they're, they're just not going to be able to get the resources they need to keep the population going. 
Okay. Um, when we look at the importance of, of these declines and what the implications are, this is the one that you're probably most familiar with. Um, what I want to point out here, I'm not sure why um, part of my slides, probably not. I keep all the important stuff on the right part of the slide, not the left part. <laughs> <laughs> I've, done this, I've done this a couple times. Anyway, so this is what we're familiar with. So we've got a couple of managed species, right? So we've got our honeybees, which we know about. Bumblebees, there's one species, Bombus impatiens, the one that's very common and doing well that we use, and then some other, other native bees. But we have, I told you there are thousands of bee species. There are only you know, a handful that we're using and managing for crop pollination. So we're, we're, we're pollinating a handful of plant species, and they're not natives. They may have been natives historically, but they've been um, changed dramatically to increase um, the pr uh, productivity. And here's just an example of some of the things we eat. So it's all about food, food security and, the, um, and business, right? It's a multi-billion dollar year industry. What I want to point out here, though, so the honeybee plays an, a tremendously important role in this. There's no question. I'm not arguing that. When we look at those thousands of other things, and not just bees, everything else, only about 5 to 10 percent, so I'll give you 10 percent, of native flower visiting insects will visit a crop plant. So what happens? When we want to increase productivity here, we're going to target things that visit crop plants. Why on earth would we target something that's not visiting crop plants if we're, you know, from the agricultural perspective? It's all about getting the pollination we need to to pollinate acres and acres of one thing. And so the conservation strategies in an agricultural context aren't going to cover, and they do not cover, threatened species. right? Because A, they're threatened, so there's not a lot of them. And B, they don't want to visit crop plants because they're crappy sources of pollen and nectar. Or they have chemicals in them that they, chemicals naturally occurring, so the nectar chemistry is a important role for decision making. They just, they, they don't like them for, for, for whatever reason. So if we flip things to the other side, remember I told you about these two faces, the other side is the ecological side. So those interactions, the diversity of interactions that I talked about, not just the bees, but the flies, the butterflies, um, the birds, so we can bring the vertebrates back in. They're called keystone species, and the reason is because it's not just about this interaction, we're now going to look at what's interacting with those plants after they've been pollinated, right? And that's this, what's called trophic level. So we've got small mammals and birds that are using the pollinated plants as a source of um, food, shelter, and nest sites. So the food, seeds, and fruit, for example, birds like to nest in particular native plants. And the pollinators keep th those things going. So in an agricultural context, we've got honeybees and a handful of managed species that are helping to feed us. We've got thousands of species and interactions that are feeding everything else on the planet. Oh, not aquatic. I don't think, but uh, the terrestrial wise, we've got this codependence. And what happens when we start removing these connections, we're removing food supply and increasing competition here, which is going to drive some species um, uh, in the direction of extinction here. We have species up here that are relying on foods down here. So, you know, bees, everything prefers something. We wouldn't have so many species unless they have what's called a, a, a particular ecological niche. They have certain things they like to eat, and they're very good at exploiting those food sources. When you remove the food source, they have to compete. And with individuals, and they're not as good at competing. And so we're going to see these cascading effects through the system when we start removing preferred food sources here at this level or at this level. Eventually, we'll remove so many connections here, we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. So that's a massive reduction in biodiversity. And we're going to lose things called ecosystem services, which I mentioned, or mentioned earlier. That's things like um, um, uh, water purification, carbon sequestration, decomposition, all these processes we take for granted. And they're free from nature, but they all depend on a healthy and diverse ecosystem. And that, because in agriculture you can see you don't have a lot of things produced and we need more pollinators, we start losing species here. Like who would think that if we want to do conserve owls, we really have to focus on pollinators and, and small mammals, and, and there, there are links. Everything is linked together in some way. And, and, and it ultimately boils down, in many cases, boils down to a connection down here and a specialized um, connection. As I said, that most of the native species are important in agriculture. The honeybee in this role has, has no role here, right? It's not native. It doesn't have, there's no, there are no native honeybee pollinated plants out there. And so, although the honeybee has tremendous importance in agriculture, in this context, we really need to focus on the native species and the connections with native plants. That's what's keeping everything going, and that's the foundation. So hopefully you can see that we've got two sides, equally important, but we need very different approaches um, for both sides. 
to give you one example, everybody's familiar with milkweed and monarchs. So we look at milkweed here, a bunch of um, bees, bumblebees visiting milkweed for nectar. We've got um, our uh, monarch larvae that are specialists. So if we don't have milkweed, we don't have monarchs. So at the larval stage, we, we do have high, special, high degree of specialization. At the adult stage, they'll visit a wide variety of things for nectar. Um, so this is, this is producing seeds. So the products of the pollination event are feeding birds and providing nesting material for birds at the next trophic level. Also, there are birds that eat, eat bumblebees, especially the males, because they don't have a stinger. Um, there are birds that will eat um, uh, butterfly larvae. And also, they have preferences. So some may prefer to eat bumblebees, and specific species of bumblebees, or specific larval stages of, of particular butterflies. That's their, their wheelhouse. That's what they've evolved to do, to effectively exploit that resource. And when we remove it, we're going to affect this level. Um, um, and so we need, to, we need to think past the plant pollinator interaction and think about that next level. That's, that's, that's extremely important. Now, conserving pollination networks and ecological networks are just conserving pollinators. Again, this idea that if we put things out and we see bees and we're, we're helping the pollinators, we can think of the plants we put out like feeders, right? And so, yes, we may be able to support a lot of bees and other things with our flowers, but the question is, is am I supporting and helping the rest of the connections in the ecosystem, the, the birds and the small mammals? So to, to drive this point home, if we look at hummingbird feeders, right? Everybody has a hummingbird feeder. This is great. I've got tons of hummingbirds. We can feed those hummingbirds, keep those hummingbirds going. And so that's one species we're, you know, in the east for hummingbirds. That's one species that we are, are helping. But if I put out my feeder and I've got a bunch of hummingbird pollinated plants, where the, the bird has to fly around. So we've got unlimited nectar here. There's probably, let's say, 10 microliters per flower here, five to 10. The bird has to work to get the food. Where do you think those birds are gonna go when you put out a feeder? They're all gonna move over here. They move over here, what happens? Plants don't get pollinated. Plant species go down. There's no food produced, no pollination. That's the, 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 um, the, the number of plants goes down, so reducing nest sites. And so just by putting out this feeder, yes, we, we, we may think we're helping hummingbirds, but hummingbirds, you know, they've been around for a while, and they can adapt to, to various things. They eat insects, and, and they um, use sap from trees as a source of food. Um, but we would be much better off to plant a bunch of monarda to keep a few hummingbirds going and everything connected to the monarda, right? Um, to, to, that way we're restoring parts of a network, not just helping one species, we're helping multiple species. And that's where the plant, we have to think of our native plants as a hub for these ecological networks. The pollinators help those plants, that connection, and then those plants are serving and helping um, other, other wildlife. So what this, what this does then is it brings up a very important distinction and something we need to think about when we're assessing habitat. That's the difference between abundance, diversity, and what's called functional diversity. So I mentioned abundance is just how many of something you have. So for bombus and patients, I said we have thousands and thousands of individuals of the same species. So that's, um, it's, it's all one species and it's in one functional group, right? Bombus and patients has a medium, medium tongue length and matches up with flowers that, that have sort of a <coughs> mid, mid length too. Uh, but if we, we look at now up to diversity, let's say we added some plants and we start to see a, a couple of other bumblebees. So here's bombus and patients, we get a couple of other bumblebee species. So we have three species. We've definitely increased diversity, but all of them have the same tongue length. So functionally speaking, they're all medium tongue species. So we have the same functional diversity that we have here. We just have more individuals that are basically doing the same thing. If we had hummingbirds, bumblebees, and butterflies, here we've increased the functional diversity, right? We have short, medium, and long tongue animals, and we've got flowers to match. We've in, and, and so we are, have increased functional diversity of the, um, from the animal side. So three species, we have three functional groups, and everything that those three functional groups support. We can also flip it and think about functional diversity from the plant side. So here we have our goldenrod, here's our bumblebee. This, this flower is what's called a simple flower. The bees and other animals just have to land. You can see its, it's tongue coming out, poking around, getting nectar from the goldenrod. And the reason we see so many things on goldenrod is because the nectar is exposed, right? Unlike that bottle of gentian I showed you where it's hidden. This attracts a certain group, the medium to short tongue bees, but a lot of the bees that we have in trouble are long tongue bees. And instead of taking goldenrod, they prefer, preferentially visit, here's our, um, 
our um, orange touch me not, right? The nectar is located at the base of the spur. Here's Bombus fervidus, one of our threatened species, with a super long tongue, and it preferentially visits um, the, the uh, flowers with more complex morphology. The nectar is hidden in the spike, or like that bottle of gentian, it's hidden. Those are the long tongue bees, or the, the bumblebee pollinated plants. And so, just by putting out something that looks like this, we're going to miss. Every, all of these connections over here. So not just Bombus fervidus, but everything connected to this particular native plant. Now that's just looking at flowers. We also have to remember that we have um, host plants. So we've got big blue stem that is a host plant for a number of uh, threatened butterfly species, right? And so it's not, it's not all about the flowers. It's about native plants and how they help and how they fit in to those pollination systems. So if we didn't have big blue stem, we wouldn't have butterflies to do the pollinating. We have to think of all the life stages, not just the adult stage, when we're, we're um, thinking about habitat restoration, what we're going to do to, uh, to help fix the, the problem. So now we're going to switch to collecting and analyzing data. So what is actually causing the decline or the degradation of these pollination systems? So there are a number of things that have been thrown out there. Pesticides getting a lot of attention. Um, we'll talk about those. Climate change, exotic species, that's both from the plant and the pollinator perspective. Disease, you've heard about disease moving from honeybees to, to wild bees, or um, you'll have increase in um, like disease outbreaks in, in native species that they think might be affecting things. And then habitat change. Of all of these, habitat change and climate change are likely the major drivers, um, but these other things, sort of, in the lab, we're looking at all of these these factors. We've looked at pesticides, we've looked at disease, we're now looking at climate change and, and, and definitely looking at exotic and, um, species and habitat change. So the question is, which ones are the major drivers? It's probably multiple factors, <coughs> but we need to really find out which one it is. And the approach that we're taking, again, we want to focus on those threatened species. And so what we do is what's called ecological pollinator conservation. That's considering the role of that threatened species, so targeting the threatened species and what it's interacting with in terms of the planet and what's interacting with those plants. So we're thinking about networks of, of uh, species networks or ecological networks. So we want to identify the, so we identify the species at risk and then what it needs to survive at every single life stage. So I mentioned the little blue stem and it being a host plant and the adults are doing something else. So here we have the monarch butterfly again, where we have specialization that needs milkweed at this stage, and at this stage, it's going to need something else. When these adults are flying around, we need to make sure we have plants at that time. We have plants before or after when their, uh, their uh, flight period is, it's not doing much good. So we really need to focus on the threatened species, what do they need at the larval stage, and where, when are they flying around, and when do they need nectar at the adult stage. For all the bees, Bumblebees, all the solitary bees, the 4,000, they basically follow the same cycle. So they're overwintering. They um, come out in March or April. In the case of bumblebees, the queens come out. They're looking for a nest site. The solitary bees, they're looking for mates, and they're looking um, to, um, for places to lay their eggs. So we get the population increasing through the summer. Uh, and then we go to the reproductive phase. And then in the case of bumblebees and, and other bees, they then go into hibernation, which is where they are right now. During this time, we have eggs laid, and then we get larvae, they pupate, and adults come out. We might have multiple cycles through the season. For bumblebees, it's a never-ending process through the end of their cycle. So what I want to point out here is that we've got, we need places for those bees to spend the winter, we need places for those bees to nest, and we need places for those bees to get nectar and pollen, and it needs to be available when they need it, not when we think they need it. Okay? So there's a lot of information that we need, but again, we're focusing in on those species at risk. And surprisingly, we don't have that information, right? Right now, the information we have is basically it's a planted and they will come mentality. And um, you know, in the case of butterflies and host plants, that, that's well established and people are thinking about that, but not necessarily focusing in on the threatened species um, to the degree that they should. And in bumblebees, um, it's, you know, there are a lot of knowledge gaps and a lot of information, misinformation out there in terms of what to do. But to put this in perspective, okay, our bees in March, April, everybody's coming out and looking for nectar and pollen. When they, get, when they wake up from their overwintering, they need nectar and pollen. Nectar is their source of fuel. If they don't have nectar, they run out of gas, they die. die. Pollen they need if they're going to start. So what happens is they have pollen, they lay eggs in the pollen, the larvae eat the pollen. So all bees need pollen to produce more bees, and they need the nectar as a source of fuel. 
In the spring, what do they have? The number one source of nectar and pollen in the spring are the willows, any willow species. This is absolutely critical for that particular period. They need willow. So bumblebee queens, the more willow I see, the more bumblebee queens I see, and that gives them the head start. That gets them through that first stage where they have enough food to start looking for a nest. Right? Once they have enough food, they search around looking for nest sites. So they spend energy looking for nests, and they come back to the willow and other things. So we're trying to figure out what else they need, but we know they love willow. Um, so willow is important for that. But a lot of butterflies that are in trouble use willow, and they have flight times in the spring where they're looking for food as well. And willow is a great source for them as well. Um, also, willow is a, good, is a host plant. So here we have threatened bees that need this and threatened butterflies. So just by planting willow, you are helping threatened species get a start. If they don't have food in the spring, they can't find a nest, they're just going to die because they run out of energy. right? And also, with climate change, if the willow blooms and goes out of bloom and then our bees come out, that's what climate change does. It puts the plants and pollinators out of sync. And if you don't have food and you're a bee or anything else, you run out of fuel, you're, you're done. Okay, so we want to make sure that they have good sources of nectar and pollen. We can also look at, again, bringing back the big blue stem and switchgrass, where we have, um, these are host plants for butterflies, right? Birds use the grasses for seeds, right? So they prefer native grasses, and this is, you know, going into Doug Ptolemy, probably heard about Doug Ptolemy. And what I'm trying to do is integrate what I'm doing with what Doug Ptolemy's doing. We're basically, we're saying the same thing, and we're just focused on, in different areas. Um, so I thought I'd bring in the birds that are visiting these grasses, the number one source of, of seed for the seeding birds are the grasses. But what I want to point out, grasses play an important role for other things. Rodents, okay? Rodents use native grasses and preferentially um, use native grasses for um, nest sites. And, and so, so why is that important? So rodents are getting a bad rap right now because of Lyme disease and ticks and things like that. But these rodents are critical for things like our owls, our endangered owl species. That's what they're feeding on. So yes, you know everything is, is uh, th what I'm trying to do is provide you with, with the big picture. And it's not just any rodent. There are specific rodent species likely that are preferred by our owl. Bumblebees, their number one nest, like where, where they prefer to nest or where they think that we prefer the nest is abandoned rodent nests. So if you have your native grasses, you've got a good rodent and diverse rodent population, odds are you're going to have um, owls and you're going to, or predatory birds, and you're going to have a lot of bumblebees. And where we're moving with the research is to figure out this connection. So there are direct benefits of natives and there are indirect benefits. We have to think beyond the animal to these next levels and, and um, to other things that may be affected indirectly if we decide to, to remove um, or not order. What benefit we will be having if we, we add native plants, certain native plants to the environment. So I've been focused on um, ecological conservation of bumblebees. I love bumblebees, as I mentioned, and bumblebees are really, it, 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 they're the best group to get, butterflies are good too, um, but in terms of bees, it's the best group to get citizen scientists to participate because they're relatively easy to identify. They're large enough that you can identify them based on color patterns. Here are all the species that were historically present in Massachusetts, um, and the ones in trouble at low elevation, here's Bombus fervidus, Bombus pennsylvanicus, Bombus uh, affinus. Um, if we go west and higher elevations, Bombus tricola is in trouble. And um, this, is, this one's not in trouble, it's also a higher elevation. The Bombus bagans is high and low elevation, and it's in, in trouble um, as well. It's starting to decline, and so we have a, ch a good chance to save it. So what we've been doing is going to you know, Breakneck Hill and other areas to try to identify um, what, are the, what are the foraging preferences of the threatened bumblebee species. And how does that competitive dynamics work? So, you know, bumblebees are generalists, that's true, meaning that they're not like a, a monarch larva that needs one thing or it dies, but that doesn't mean that the bumblebees don't have preferences. And so we went out to try to test to see if they have preferences for different species, for different plants, native plant species, or different plant species in general in the landscape. And so here are some data from breakneck and then some, some areas, because we've got trickle and trinarias, the, the higher elevation species in here. What I want to point out is that there, are 25, there were 25 plant species where I saw a bumblebee visiting a flower. Right, so this is looking at nectar. But of those 25 species, you can see that in every, every case, every species, here are my bumblebee species, over 60% uh, of their visits were to just a couple of things. 
And when we break it down to medium, short, medium, and long tongue species, we see that there's a clear dividing line, right? Our long tongue bees are visiting vetch and red clover. We expect that. Our short tongue bees are visiting milkweed and goldenrod. We expect that. But what's interesting is within categories, we notice differences. So in our medium tongue bees, perplexus and patients of griseocolis, all of them are the same size, the same tongue length, the same everything. But they are very different in what they prefer. Bombus griseocolis, when milkweed's in bloom, basically it's a milkweed specialist. It loves milkweed. Right? And, and um, so if you see milkweed and you see a bumblebee, odds are it's griseocolis. In patients, I, I have, let's say for argument's sake, I've seen one since 2015, one or two bombus in patients on milkweed. They don't like milkweed, even though the nectar is there, they can get it. For whatever reason, they don't like it. Instead, they prefer vetch and spreading dog bait. Then we see Bombus perplexus that really loves bush honeysuckle. This bush honeysuckle, and then um, to some degree, Bombus vagans does as well. Um, but we, what, the point is here that it's not all about tongue length. There's something else. Nectar chemistry plays an important role, and we're looking to see what are those compounds. It's like a drug to the bees. Some they like, some they don't. Like, right? They don't like the taste of it, their gustatory preferences, and we're trying to figure those things out. So it's not, even if we just use tongue length, um, that, that's, that's not enough. When we look at pollen preferences, things become even more specialized. So a bumblebee, when it visits a flower, you can tell whether it's visiting nectar or pollen. Of those 25 species, there were only two that they were collecting pollen from, and primarily it was St. John's wort, right, and meadowsweet. As I said, they need pollen, good sources of pollen, not just any pollen, good sources of pollen to get their numbers up. That's how they make new bees and they make big bees and healthy bees is with the pollen quality. So for what, they, they highly prefer these species for pollen. The question is why, right? And so we're trying to figure that out. That's the next step in the research is to figure out what it is about the chemistry in the, of that pollen that is really good. Does it help in, in, in reproduction? I will add to that that we see that for, um, you know, this is one study site in one year that Virginia and Carolina rose are very important uh, pollen sources. And something new this year, it turns out that Plantago is a really good pollen source. So when I was out west, Bombus tricola was all over Plantago collecting pollen. And that was strange to me. So the list I have, again, is data driven. But it suggests that, that either the high, higher quality pollen plants were in the area, or they're actually using Plantago. And you wouldn't think Plantago is, it's not, it doesn't have a nice showy flower. You know, everybody thinks it has to look beautiful. You can barely even tell. You see the bees in the grass, what looks like grass, and they're thinking, what, what's going on here? And they're actually collecting pollen. So this was a surprise this year that I've added. For those of you that have heard me speak before, I've added that to the slide. Um, so we, what, what the, the take-home message here is that when we're thinking about what to plant, we have to think about nectar and pollen sources, and those two things are separate. The other thing we need to consider is whether it's a native or an exotic and what impact exotics um, have. And when we look at what the different bumblebee species are visiting, what we see is that some species don't like non-natives. They prefer natives. And some species actually prefer the, the non-natives. Um, but I'm going to add a little bit to this story in a minute. If we have all non-natives, we're not going to see very many of uh, Griseocolis, Stranarius, or Perplexus because they don't, they don't prefer it, right? They'll just go elsewhere. So we see the effects of the exotic species. Um, what's, what's interesting and what's new, what we found, is that this year I have a site in uh, Western Mass, and it was all red clover, serrated for two years. This year, I've, I've, I've asked people to, to not mow. Um, I asked Freddie not to mow kindly, and she let some of the willow bloom. And the first year, we saw five or six queens. And I think last year, we saw 20 queens, where they weren't there before. We didn't see queens until the first thing came into bloom uh, at Breakneck Hill. So that's a huge change, and is really giving them a head start. Now we have to figure out the nest site situation. Um, but that just shows what a difference not mowing can make for helping the functional diversity. Anyway, so I told them not to mow. What came into bloom is Prunella vulgaris, salphia, this purple flower. And what happened was, here's Vagans in trouble, here's Fervus in trouble, here's Borealis, which isn't in trouble, but has a long tongue. Those bees, all literally one week, they were all over red clover. The same amount of red clover was there, but once Prunella came into bloom, all those bees went to Prunella. So yes, at some sites where there's red clover, that's a good you should keep the red clover to support those species. But if you can, plant prunella. 
because Prunella is the native that they would be visiting if we didn't have red clover. And this Prunella, again, because it's a native, likely has connections at other levels and supporting other things. And so we want to plant Prunella and, and then eventually replace the red clover we have with Prunella so we can swap out the resource for a native. All right? The other thing we need to be cautious of, not just non-natives, you can consider cultivars to be non-natives. All right. So there's been um, Annie White in uh, UVM did a lot of uh, work, um, good work, looking at um, the effects. So they had the straight species, and then they had all of these variants, and looked at pollinators uh, whether they visited or whether they preferred these these variants. And in, in the case of bumblebees, so here's echinacea. We see different colors. Once you start changing things, the pollinators change. Uh, the other one is um, New England aster. We have this variant. They won't touch this or they don't touch it as much as this. So the question is why? It's not the color. What happens, probably, um, in my experience, what happens with cultivars is when you breed for show, or you breed for cold tolerance, or you breed for something, the plant only has so many resources, and it has to reallocate resources. And so what happens is it pulls the nectar resources, because nectar isn't, it benefits the plant, but it isn't a critical resource, right? So that you're pulling, forcing the plant to reallocate its resources, because you're selecting it, you're pulling the nectar and affecting its chemistry possibly and the leaf chemistry and, and a lot of things go along with that selection that's it's not just the flower color. And I've had many experiences where I've, I didn't realize it was a, a cultivar and I couldn't understand why my bees weren't visiting the plants and then I took it out and checked for nectar and there was no nectar. And this is from places where they're passed off as straight species but they're really not. And so we really need to watch for um, cultivars and what impact. They look great to us, right? And it's, it's kind of fun to create new, new variants, but when we look at those networks, they are there for a reason, and when we start affecting them, we're gonna have um, negative effects. And even if, the, if, even if changing it did increase the number of visitors we had, it doesn't mean that the seeds are gonna taste the same. It doesn't mean that the leaf tissue is gonna taste the same, right? So it's not just, again, it's not the animal, it's not the pollinator, it's the system that we have to think about. Um, okay, now, I'm just quickly going to touch on pesticides and neonics in particular. So, you know, chemicals in the environment, <coughs> and we, I'm going to look at this through that network idea and that this one size fits all and just talk a little bit about the neonics. So the neonics, you know, they um, were introduced in the 90s. The reason that they're so effective is because they, they um, when you put them in the soil, you put them on seeds, the plant takes them up and distributes them throughout the whole plant. So the plant basically has, you're giving the plant resistance. And, uh, and so if something comes to eat the leaves or eat the flowers, they are going to uh, ingest the, the pesticide. The problem is that if the plant is something that's a host plant, so it's beneficial, or if it is nectar and pollen, so we have flowers on our plant, like this, this uh, rose, that the animals that are coming to collect the nectar and pollen for food are ingesting small amounts of the pesticide, all right? These pesticides can persist in the soil for up to three years in the case of clopanidin, which is the one I've been working with. As we move through time, imidacloprid was the first one. When they become more effective, right, it increases the, the persistence in the environment and also increases the negative effects. So whatever we found with imidacloprid, with clofanidin, it's, 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 it's a more potent pesticide. Um, and in fact, a lot of pesticides, what happened was that the animal would in, ingest, and, the, and so they try to break it down. So all, all of the insects are trying to de detoxify. And when they detoxify, you break down into what are called metabolites. The metabolites were more toxic than the original pesticide. So what did the chemical companies do? They took the metabolites and created a new <laughs> variant of uh, a neonic. Right? That's more potent because, hey, this is, this is killing them quicker than the other, so we're, and that's how things have progressed. All right? Now, thinking about things from this ecological pollinator conservation, what goes on to test these pesticides is everything's tested on honeybees and honeybee workers. They're starting to bring in bumblebees, but the bumblebees that are brought in, bombus and patients, workers. All right? Bombus and patients, I told you, there's no problem. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at, try to figure out what, how it might be affected. As I said, it persists in the soil through the whole, you put it on in the spring, it persists through the entire year and then into the next year. And if you spray it on a plant and you think it's staying on that plant, it's not. It's getting through the soil and probably being taken up by things that you, you um, think are okay. 
So this idea can, in, in, through surface runoff and things, it's, it, it can get into the soil and then all plants can take it up. And so you're contaminating nectar and pollen sources for wild plants. So in these agricultural areas, you've got milkweed and other things growing. They, they, and studies have shown that they have small amounts of this pesticide. So we want to know what effect that would be having on queens, workers, which are currently being used for testing, and male bees. And so what we did was we took individuals and we were able to control how much they were ingesting um, daily. And we, we knew how big they were, and so we could convert everything to nanograms taken in per gram of bee. And we looked at five, seven, and 10 parts per billion, which tends to be um, what uh, is well within the field realistic doses. And, uh, and what we found down here, just, you know, the numbers aren't important, just look at the colors. Blue means that there was mortality. And so we see at seven parts per billion, this, this is uh, queens, workers, and males, by the way, sorry. Um, so we see that males at seven parts per billion, so we fed them for two weeks. Within a week, half of the male population was dead, uh, feeding at seven parts per billion, which isn't much. So this chronic <coughs> oral exposure. At 10 parts per billion, both all queens, workers, and males died, but when we control for body size, nanograms per gram of bee per day, we see that queens are much more sensitive than, than workers. And so it turns out that at levels that this workers would be unaffected, queens and males are really affected. Their survival goes down. You need queens and males to keep the population going, and so if we apply these results to queens and males of threatened species, and if, if pesticides are playing a role, they're likely more sensitive than bombs and patients, um, we, th this is a possible mechanism for decline in agricultural areas. So the pesticides are a <coughs> uh, problem in urban and agricultural areas, not so much in, na in natural areas. So other things may be driving decline, but pesticides are accelerating declines in those areas where they're being used. They're not major drivers. The other thing I want to say is that um, when they do the testing, there's no controversy right now about whether, um, whether the um, neonics are causing trouble with honeybees, the, the, the hive losses in honeybees. And what I'll say on that is, so they measure, they, they have hive loss, and the state will measure and look for neonics, and they haven't found them. What I'll say is that currently the instrumentation that they have can't detect low levels of the pesticide, below 7 parts per million. We've sent samples to the USDA, and they can't detect them. We've used a different approach, the genetic approach, and we find that at one or five parts per billion, they are clearly affected. Their genetic gene expression patterns are totally out of whack, and it's affecting things like learning and memory, and, and, and there's, there have been a lot of studies showing these sublethal effects. And so just because we can't detect it doesn't mean it's not there and not having it. Um, I'll say that. But going back to what about threatened species, we were able to look in areas where Obama's baby ants is still very abundant, just look at workers, a smaller sample, and, and compared to bottles and patients workers, and as we expect, the species that are in trouble are much more sensitive. So seven parts per billion, the workers of this species, after three days, half the population, this is 50%, 50% of the population was dead um, after just uh, three days of exposure at these ultra low doses. For the record, chronic oral toxicity in honeybees is around 20 parts per billion. So we use honeybees to set the standards, and then we go out and we spread it thinking we're doing, everything's okay. There are thousands of insects that differ in their ability to detoxify things that are likely being affected by it. And so we need to get a more comprehensive approach when we start looking at these pesticides. And, um, and so that's, that's all I, I will say on, on, um, on the news. I mean, I could say a lot, but I'm <laughs> going to keep it there. Uh, and I've, you know, I've tried to help get things passed where the, the people that are applying it have to get some training and appreciate the biodiversity. And you know, just because you spray when things aren't bloom, there are lots of insects that are using plants that are a food source for birds and other things that are around when the flowers aren't in bloom or when it's dark, right? So that's, that's not um, necessarily a good approach on it. Anyway, so how do we take the data that we've collected and um, develop more, increase this idea of functional diversity or these ecological networks? So here we start looking at what I think is, is a pretty big problem currently with, uh, with pollinator conservation efforts. And that is that, we, again, we have this one-size-fits-all approach. So I mentioned to you that, that in bumblebees, so here we have bumblebees, digger bees. There are, there are 50 species in here alone, digger bees, large carpenter bees. So we ha we're, we're at the group level, we're starting to categorize. And then it, there's a check whether you know, it's, it's a good bumblebee plant or not. 
Clover is in check. I told you that Bombus Burbis, which is declining, and Bombus Vegans, they absolutely have. I've gone to Tower, Tower Hill, other places. Um, another one, Bridge of Flowers, right? Bridge of Flowers, to, to, to go back to the cultivar. 400 feet, everything, wall of color, left to right. I only saw three bumblebees. Tower Hill, acres of things in bloom. Where did I see Bombus Verbitus? On only place I saw it on the property was in the field with red clover. It wasn't anywhere on site. And I've studied Tower Hill multiple times. So here it's not even checked, right? This is a major source of nectar and red clover persists through the whole season. It's, it's absolutely critical for those threatened species, yet it's not even on the list. The other thing is rose. I told you how important it is as a pollen source. Yes, it's checked, but let's say I choose pensamine over rose. That's going to have a major impact on threatened species. They need this for pollen. This is critical. Pensamine, yes, it, it supplies nectar um, to some species, but not all species and not necessarily the threatened species are going to be visiting pensamine. And also, pensamine, some species of pensamine they like and others they absolutely do not like. So we need to get things from this general overview down to species level, both from the pollinator side and the plant side, and focusing in on, on those threatened species. And I'm sure you've seen there are lots of seed mixes out there. I told you about the functional diversity. We'll, we'll, if you look at this to start, what's the first thing you notice? It's all composite. It's all open. There's, there's nothing with a complex morphology like our bottle gentian. There's nothing with a long tube. Our long tongue bees are going to avoid this completely. Their tongue gets in the way. They don't like short things that have exposed nectar because they can't compete against short tongue bees. Their tongue is like an elephant's trunk. It gets in the way. They're looking for things like the Monaro over here. So this one is doing a better job, but there's no neck, there's no pollen sources here. And remember, we have to supply these, these threatened species with food from snow melt to the first hard frost. So yes, we may have Monarda, but what, what I'm seeing across the state is that Monar is there, but the things that they need early in the season are not there, so we're not seeing the species. So you can plant all the Monarda you want, but unless you hit them, with the willow and other things that they need early in the season and give them a nest site, you're not going to be helping anything. You're not, you're not giving them the nectar because they can't make it that far. They haven't made it that far. So we need to bring them back starting you know, with this more systematic approach to things. <coughs> the other thing is, so this is, this is um, a draft from the Xerces Society. So we look at, they've divided it up, and this is for what we should do on, um, in agricultural areas to try to help, I, I, I'm assuming, that it's not helping the ecological side, so the threatened species, but it's trying to, I guess, increase abundance, right? Because if you look at the spring, golden alexanders and indigo, there are no, there's no willow here, and there's no, um, there's, there's no major nectar and pollen sources targeting threatened species over here. Also, these mixes, 3%, so some of the things that are good, so pensamin digitalis isn't preferred. So let's say Asclepius, right, or, um, um, something else that would be important. It's a very small percentage of what they actually like and need in these seed mixes, and the odds are, you know, it, it may not even germinate. So we, we need to really we, there's, we need a major overhaul and a different approach, and we need to again target the threatened species, set out our goals for conservation. If it's agricultural abundance, fine, but don't pretend like you're doing something for biodiversity because you're absolutely not. And we need to make that distinction. And you need to start asking questions. When somebody gives you a list, say, where did that list come from? Who told you that? I have yet to figure out where Xerces Society and Polyridal are gets their list. I've asked everybody. And as far as I can tell, they've combed the literature. And so for bumblebees, people have studied bumblebees before the decline, myself included, and my advisor. And you would record the plant species that you would see the bumblebee. You're studying the bumblebee for another reason. And those, those what's, it seems like they're using that for the, to, to put them on the list. Um, or they may see a bumblebee and think it's okay. We see a lot of bumblebees and just not pay attention to what species they're targeting. Um, I haven't been able to figure it out. But what we need to do is to move from that to something like this, something that's more data-driven. So I told you, based on our research, Carolina and Virginia rose are major sources of pollen for all, not just bumblebees, all bees. Right? I've seen dozens and dozens of, of bee species collecting pollen on native roses. Now, the, these native roses are a uh, host plant for the apple sphinx moth, right? Which is, um, and the apple sphinx moth is a food source for eastern whippoorwills. So you see how just by planting this one thing, we're helping support threatened here, helping support threatened here, and you know there are birds that will eat the rose hips, help to get them through the winter. And again, I need more information from the threatened bird side to see if that may be a preferred food source. But just by planting the, the native roses, you are helping out multiple threatened species and restoring a whole network, right? 
um, versus planting something and seeing a couple of um, bees on it, and then that's pretty much all, all you're going to see, or a few butterflies. Uh, even more so, I would say, if I had to write, and I have a list, again, based on our data has shown that bag ants and firmness in the east really like wild yellow indigo. So a breakneck is one plant. Okay, there's 40 acres, there's one or two wild yellow indigo plants. When they're in bloom, I see very few vegans. The ones I do, I'll see a vegans here when there are, there's a ton of other stuff for them to visit, but they will seek out this wild yellow indigo. Every year it's in bloom, I see a couple of workers. So that tells me that it's highly preferred. It is a host plant for two threatened butterfly species. And again, we need to think about the bird connection as well, eating the larva. It's possible there are threatened birds that prefer frosted elfin larva. That's their preference. And when this goes down, this goes down, then we start to see effects down here. So we're trying to put these connections, but just to show you that by planting one thing, it can have a major impact. So what we have to move is to start to weigh the plants in terms of their ecological impact or ecological benefits and relate it to the biodiversity. And this, this means that we need to bring together expertise from different areas and we need to get more data. And that's where you come in, hopefully. Um, so the Ecology Project I developed because I can't be everywhere in the state as much as I want to be. I can't survey all the different areas in the state. And so I wanted people to help me to collect data, not just on the pollination. What separates out the Ecology Project is I am interested in the interaction. I'm as interested in the plant as I am the animal, right? And those, those interactions. And so what I wanted to do is, is help I had people send me short videos initially or pictures of interactions and then I would look for patterns and test them against my research at my main field sites. And I'm, I'm noticing that that's, you know, it's pretty consistent. So the, the problem was that I was getting a lot of things were taking off nicely and I was getting a lot of uh, information. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't spend my day going through as important as it is. And so I teamed up with um, Elizabeth Ryder and Carolina Ruiz who are more on the CS side of things, and we developed a, a, a web app so that you could take your video and ID the, the bee and ID the plant, and there's a new version of that coming out very soon. I've worked very hard, and Freddie's given me a lot of feedback. Um, <laughs> negative, but constructive. She's <laughs> <laughs> called me and said, this stupid ad, it doesn't work, and we've had some great conversations. Um, but there's a new version in the web app, you just go to the website, and it's, it's not a standalone app, it's good for an Android and iPhone, so it works on any browser. And the good thing about the app is, it, once it, you open it, you can work offline with it. So, you know, I'm out in Western Mass, there's no signal for miles, not, not a Verizon signal anyway, um, but I can still use the app and still collect data through the app. Um, and so we have the, the iPhone web app, and then we have all these visualization tools where you can actually see the results. You can go and you can look at a map, see how you contributed, see what was there historically, and, and it's, it's a very, um, you're not just contributing to the project, but you can actually see the benefit, how you benefited the project by adding data. And I have a lot of citizen scientists, I'm very, very um, grateful to them for, for supplying um, data, uh, especially when they find bombs furnace or trickle they're really helping me to understand these things and collect data in areas where I, I, just, I just can't be there. When I get grad students in the near future, they'll all be out there, but I, I can't do it myself. Anyway, so the, the website is becology.wpi.edu. There's a lot you can do on the site. We're gonna have uh, modeling, the visualization tools, Again, I, I, this is a work in progress as well. I'm gonna be adding a lot to the site. I have a long list of things. I just need to find the time and the students to help me. Um, but from the site, if you go up to the upper right corner, um, or if you're on your phone, there's, there'll be what's called a hamburger menu, a bunch of lines. You click on that. The last option is web app, and you'll pull up the homepage of the web app, We Are Ecology. You can collect data, or you can, you can, um, you can um, there's a tutorial. Uh, and so what we're doing now, what we've done with the app is you can, you upload your video and you can take multiple pictures, single frames of the video when the bee's in the right position to identify. It has, um, it helps you to identify the bee going from the abdomen to the thorax to the head. It then helps you to identify the flower. So we're working on this part where you're going to link out and you're going to be able to match your flower to known species to help to identify the plant and also the behavior. And I just met with somebody the other day that we're going to use face recognition software so that the, the, the video, once you upload the video, the web app itself can identify the bee, the plant, and the behavior. Was it doing nectar or pollen collecting? So this is a big innovation and, and, and it's really going to help to, to move things forward very, very quickly. Um, now, so where we are so far, 
with all of your help, the citizen science, the ecology, and my research, is that it seems that the trouble is in the winter, so either overwintering or in the spring, in terms of nectar um, and pollen sources, in the case of like willow, for example, or nest sites. All of the evidence so far is pointing to that direction. And so we're starting a new, um, so we're going to continue with the ecology looking at flower preferences, but we're expanding to look at nesting sites this year. I mentioned this relationship between small mammals and bumblebees, and so we are now looking for um, funding um, to, to fund this, this project, and I've got, um, based on some um, findings from a citizen scientist, actually, that was consistent with what I've been finding in the field, I now have a research plan to move forward, and what we're going to do is identify what these threatened species need, and eventually it's going to end up where we can put out boxes that have the right cues that those, those threatened species need to set up nests, and we can put them out, just like with our floral resources, to help to support those, those native species. I will say now there are bumblebee boxes, they're about 10% successful, 10 to 20%, and those that are there, it's all common species, it's all bombus and patients. So it's not, you're not, when you put out those boxes, you are not helping the threatened species. And it's because they don't have the cues that they need, that they're looking for. When you see a bumblebee queen foraging, she's clearly <coughs> looking for something. I think I know what it is. And so I'm very excited about this part of the project where we're going to, um, there are three aims that we have in the project. And so, you know, um, we're looking for support for, um, for, that, for that project. Um, also hibernation sites, so it's, it's extremely difficult to find a bumblebee nest, so that's why this is, this is lag behind the floral resource preference. The hibernation sites, it's even more difficult. Again, I have a sense, but we're going to tackle this issue first and then go to hibernation sites to see if it's possible that snow cover is driving everything, right? Everything's moving to higher elevations because there's more snowpack and there's more um, leaf litter to, to insulate them when they get into the ground. When you blow your leaves, what you're doing is you are allowing cold temperatures to go farther down and you are killing off animals that expect there to be snow cover and leaf litter. We don't have as much snow at lower, lower elevations, so things are getting down. I think a lot of these species are being negatively affected, but when we blow leaves, it's just accelerating the issue, which is why we don't tend to find a lot of threatened species in urban areas. They tend to be more on, on conservation lands away from um, gardens and, and leaf blowers. Okay, so just to finish then, um, to wrap things up, so bringing the ecology home, I said at the, uh, at the start of the talk that I really want you to be citizen scientists, to go out and try things, to, to, to get the, the skills to ID different things, to see how you're doing, and then make changes, and then see how, what effect those changes have had, that, that scientific process that I was talking about. And it starts with just seeing what you have and assessing, doing an inventory, what do you have, is, is it in bloom, when's it in bloom, if you observe bumblebees, are they collecting nectar or pollen? I run workshops all the time. I'm sure I'll be running another one in this area. Um, Freddie will probably hit me up right after this talk. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to do it, very happy to do it, to give you the, the tools you need to do this. Um, but you can take videos of bumblebees. If you don't want to use the app and you want to help me, you can send me videos, put them in a Google Drive, and give me access. A lot of people have done it that way, and I enter the data. Or, or, or get the data and put it into Excel sheets. Um, anything you can send me, any support, you know, giving me access to land. Uh, it's the end of the year, you know, if you, if you want to, to, to donate, uh, UMass is a, a nonprofit. So a number of people have, have made generous donations that, especially with the um, nesting project, it's going straight to that nesting project and I am already have things for the spring to get, to get that project going. Um, so any way you can help spreading the word as well and just when you go into your garden thinking about things in a different way, if that's the only thing you got out of this talk, or you did never want to hear me talk again, hopefully you'll get something out of it, that, that when you go into your garden, look closely at what you have, and then say, I wonder if this is threatened or common. If you just ask that question and then look into it, then I think um, you know, collectively we can we appreciate the diversity and what we need and what we have and don't have and what we need to do to fix it. Um, that we can really solve things before everything goes extinct. I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, and with our collectively, we can we can change things in a beneficial way. Not just for pollinators, but those systems and the biodiversity that they support, the networks. Um, that's what we really need to do. And with that, I would like to thank um, a long list of collaborators. They're all cut off. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Frank Nectel is here, and we'll put Freddie there.
but also others uh, associated with Breakneck have been have given me tons of data, been very very valuable um, funding sources. And then if you wanted to contact me, so I have a plant list that I uh, forgot to bring. Um, but if you, s I can send you a PDF of based on our research, I have <coughs> plants for pollen and nectar plants for those threatened species. And if you wanted that to think about what you have and what you might want to add, just send me an email. So it's it's um, rjgear at umassg.edu. And if you want to see what else I'm up to with my research, this is my lab website. And I, I um, the ecology website I gave you earlier is, is um, ecology.wpi.edu. And with that, I will take any, any questions that you, that you have. Thank you for your time.
And so I have a list when I go in and look, I, I would tell you what to do. She has a different view on what she wants to put in there because those lists I showed you earlier are easier to get a hold of and they're easier to establish and you don't have to maintain them. What I'm proposing might take a bit more work, mm -hmm. but, but we're certainly moving in, in that direction where they're, they're going to get certified and when they get certified at a certain level, they get um, some sort of um, benefit um, for, for those efforts. They get some sort of, um, the government's involved at some level, I don't know those details, but, but we're moving in that direction. I'm a part of that. Sorry for rambling. Yes? I wonder if you could comment on <coughs> non-native uh, garden plants. You know, I have a variety yeah. of plants in the garden, but the, and I, I too watch bees, and um, the plant that has the, the highest diversity and the most insects is a hydrangea, especially climbing hydrangea. Well, so again, there's diversity and functional diversity, so I would say that those threatened species aren't visiting. Um, it's the common species that, that you're seeing, um, and I'll also say that, that remember, we, we need to look beyond the animal to the, um, the next, what else is using the plant, and whether it is or is not, and whether swapping that out for a native would have more of an impact on the threatened species and that functional diversity that I talked about. So I don't, I mean, so, so my list is um, native plants, um, but I, I have a lot of data on, on non-natives, but not necessarily cultivars in the garden, which is why I pulled Annie White's information. But if you want to take videos of all of the diversity that you see and send them to me, I can tell you, you know, where I might add it to the list if it's, if it's good. But because it's a non-native, we would want to find out what we could swap it with to benefit the network. That's that's really what it's what it's all about. And I don't think that there's a, a non-native that, first of all, you're replacing a native species, so you're losing diversity there, but also how it affects the connections. Yes? So if you go around looking at plants that set seeds successfully, is there a way to determine whether those plants are setting seeds because they can self-pollinate and set seeds? Yes. Or, so uh, do you have like information as to which ones do that and which ones don't? So <laughs> Um, so, on the plant side of things, the pollination side, there's that's a whole other. Um, to do what you said can be done. You could bag flowers. We could look at selfing rates, and we could look at um, we could transfer pollen artificially. And we could look at when there's an insect that visits. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. That is a more involved experimental process, and uh, most plant species we do not have that information. So many we don't know the major pollinator, the important pollinator um, of that, and then how much is self and not self. There is a lot known, but I think in this context, things haven't been brought into this context yet, but it could be done. But, but it's pretty obvious that from year to year, some, for whatever reason, some plants set a lot more seeds than others, including insect pollinated plants and not just right. insects. Right, right. So the question is, is it because the, because the insect populations, the pollinator populations are fluctuating from year to year too, um, there are plants that have fail safe, so some are self incompatible. Right. So if they're setting, they're setting. Some, they, you know, if they don't get an animal, that they they will self more than they would if they um, than they would if they they had uh, if they were animal pollinated. But that's, I mean, I don't have that information, but I could if you had a plant species or you had an area where you wanted to look at that, I could tell you or look at that to see what effect it, it would have. Um, or what, how important the animal is to keeping that plant population going. Is that where you're going with the yeah, question? I, I guess so. It's just that, uh, from my standpoint, identifying a plant is a bit more easier than identifying an insect, which is moving around, and if you don't catch it, you get it in videos, you're not going to be able to figure it out. But a plant is there, right. and you can tell whether it's set seed uh, over on your own time schedule. Yeah, no, it's true because plants, you know, have to chase them are easier. I, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think that the identifying the insects, I mean, if you have a phone, you could you could get video or you could get a sense of what's visiting. Um, but I mean, I have, if you wanted to look at it experimentally, I have pollination bags and things that you would need to figure out the selfing and 
you go out and you have to do observations at particular times to see how much visitation you get and then relate it to seed set. So it's, it's an involved process and you have to involve observation of something. Even if you don't know what it is, how much something is visiting it, you need to have that type of information to understand, to, to answer your question. Um, so if you see something going into a flower, you just count how many somethings you see and related to seed set, then you would get an answer. I was thinking that people already have a pretty good set, sense of which plants are- Some well plants are very well studied, where they can count pollen grains on stigmas. The vast majority are not. So we have, just like the honeybees a model, almost and patients is a model, plants are a model species where we know a lot about them, but we don't know everything about every plant species and we need more information. So that's the plant side where I, talk to people that need a plant trust and conservation and say, give me this information. If you don't know it, could somebody work on this? And then I would bring it into, you know, together we would do the pollination system, figure out, answer that question, type of question. Yes, then I'm going to. Yeah, yes, you. Me, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question about tick tubes. I don't know if people put uh, down tick tubes that contain cotton balls soaked in permethrin. Yeah. Which Mice are intent, you know, take back to their nests. If if mouse nests are being used as, you know, hmm. abandoned mouse nests are being used as uh, nests for bumblebees, is there any data on the harm that might cause? No. Well, I mean, it's no at that level, no. And and whether it makes <laughs> the nest site no longer suitable, that's what I'm trying to get at with this next next set of experiments on nesting preferences. So um, if, it, if the mice are not there to make a nest that's an issue, or if the nest is contaminated, let's say the mouse dies in the nest, mm -hmm. bumblebees probably aren't gonna take it up. And so effectively it's taken out of the, the mix as a potential nest site. Mm -hmm. So those types of things we're looking at. But, yeah. So um, I found it interesting that in, in Europe, certain uh, properties aren't allowed to be sold. Their invasive plants aren't removed from the property. So like not weed in London, if you on your property, like lead paint and pavement you know, here. So I also find it interesting that there's financial incentives to make your house green. Right. So do you feel like there's any inkling or discussion uh, among, and could there be among local politicians to give property owners financial incentives? To I think so, plants right. Um, in Minnesota, they have a program where if you try to make your yard pollinator friendly, that they will, there's some incentive. Mm -hmm. So there are a few other states, Minnesota's one. I think that's headed in the right direction. Now, the problem is what they're telling the plant isn't necessarily doing what they want it to do, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And yes, I do think that the invasive issue and other other things, that it's, that it's a good way to go about things. Um, and you know, Europe, in terms of what they're doing, they're quite a bit ahead of us um, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I do I, I I haven't been in a discussion with anybody about that. Um, do I think it's possible? I don't know. Um, well, like government with like you know uh, political science department of graduate school and as well as a science or you collaborate have graduate students promoting that discussion. I certainly would be open to. I would participate in something like that. Maybe there'd be some cross pollination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All well, about cross pollination. That's why I have a site. In um, more cross pollination would be better. Uh, we need more cross pollination than what we have. And I don't know of any programs headed in that direction, but locally, it's a great idea, and I, I would support something like that, getting rid of the invasives in particular, because again, the invasives bloom, but what's visiting them is the common bombs and patients. It's not the threatened species, and honeybees. So you'll see tons of bees all over them, but it's not the ones you want. And what they do is they choke out the plant species that are helping those threatened species and stealing pollinators from them. So it's, it's a big problem. Yes? I'm a landscaper, and my staff this year have been reporting that they're seeing praying mantis eating bees. Hmm. Are you aware of that? And they claim that they're, one of them looked up the species of praying mantis and said there are no native praying mantis here in the States and that these must be exotic things. Hmm. So, Can you repeat her question? Yeah, so it's about praying mantises that they, she works for a landscape company and they reported seeing praying mantis eating bees and whether praying mantis are native or not. So 
That part, I don't know. Um, in terms of anything that eats insects, bees are on the table. So I've seen spiders, lots of spiders with bees, workers, um, on flowers, and males don't sting, so they're a great food source if you can tell male from a worker. So later in the season, they'll switch to bumblebees, for example, because it's all males that don't sting, and they're nice and you know, sure they have a, a good value um, <laughs> nutritionally. But um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. About that. <coughs> whether it's whether this year is an odd year and it's happening, where it hasn't, I have not seen that, but I could see how it's possible. Well, I have an opinion, but I also have young kids, and so uh, I will say that there are many things that go into a decision, and it's the negative impact from a biodiversity standpoint is there, but then there's another cost from our perspective, and that's all. I've it's a political hot potato, and I'm not going to go there. <laughs> if I could dance, I'd be dancing around. Um, so yeah, it's it's informed decisions. So we know that doing certain things harm, but then other things harm, and they hit closer to home. And so we need to decide. So you know, again, if if um, yeah, that's that's as much as I can. Especially because now they're trained by helicopters. Right. Across, so what I'll say. Like yeah, I will say that I feel that the, the technology is there to be able to target specific species. And the chemical companies are not putting their money into it, but they, if they did, they could target single species and not harm anything else and take them out. Um, that's, I, I strongly, I, I know that that technology is there, but because it's easier just to spray and nobody cares and kill everything and they're, they're getting the job done. Um, so I think that they should channel their efforts. I think we need to move in a different direction so that we could fix the problem and also help minimize the impact. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, my son and I have been involved in your recology project since the oh. summer when we got introduced to, to the Sudbury Valley's trustees group. So it's been Thank really you. fun for him to get engaged and me to learn. One of the things I wanted to ask was, you mentioned there's a new version of the app. Yes. The hardest part for us was identifying the flowers. Yes. Because there is such a long list of flowers that we couldn't really tell. I, a lot of times said unknown. Um, it was in the picture, but it wasn't necessarily. Right. So, so what happens is when I get in the database, I ID it. And that's a lot of time. So I, the new version will have, will address that issue. And then I'm, I need a, I have all the information. I just need a student to put it up to do the ID for the plant ID to get it up. So you know the bees, it's 11 species maybe uh, for plants, it's hundreds. So um, I need to get right now. I need photos of flowers of the different species. A lot of them you can't use them from different websites, and so we have to go out and take our own photos. So if you wanted to participate and you had photos of different plants, it could be cultivars or just know what the name of the cultivar is or send them to me so that we can add them to the database so that I, what you're going to do is take a picture of the flower and then it's going to pull up based on the color it's going to you'll be able to sort down to get to the level of species to match it okay um, and um, as I said with the face recognition type software it would like plant finder or iNaturalist that type of thing where you, as soon as you put the video in it'll tell you what it is we're headed in that direction but there'll be something that will help you in the next version plus the website the ecology website I've got, I'm going to put a ton of informational plant ID on there to help you so you can go to that and then go back to the app and enter it once you figure it out from the website. So that's what's a working problem. Just a quick follow up then. Um, am I interpreting the graphs you had up there correctly? Like when you mentioned that certain um, bee species are, like the graphs sort of show like only a, a couple of preferred that's flowers, right. but there's all other that would be another part of those bar charts that just was left out? Or That's right. So Well, yeah, so um, in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Some are only visiting a handful of species, at one in particular at different stages of their cycle. Um, some are visiting a lot more. So some are definitely more generalized. And I will say, you know, in areas where one thing isn't available, they will switch to something else. So it's not like there isn't something, but the preference tells us that one's higher quality or they're tuned to that more, and so that's that, that's what we're, we're focusing on. But yes, that 
if it was 60%, if it was 40%, then maybe two things are likely multiple things, but 60% of the visits were to that particular plant species, and then the rest of it would be made up of other species. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering if any uh, landscape organizations are connecting with your initiatives for Yeah, so I've definitely given talks at different landscape organization, like meetings and things. I don't know which ones. I know, I definitely know I have. I'm working with um, a landscape architect, Kevin Abramson, who was involved in the um, Great Barrington Pollinator Plan and now has started his own thing just as a, um, you know, he asked me about plants and surveys and things. Um, but no is the answer to your I'm not working with, with uh, larger groups, but I certainly would like to get the word out and work with those groups. Because um, I think that that's, you know, it's covering a lot of land and we could get a lot of, um, move things forward um, in the urban areas. So feel free to shoot through my email. <laughs> 2020, still open to talk. Yeah. Yes. I was always imagining, oh, it's the herbaceous lower level plants that, that are the bees focus and, and we want meadow, more meadows and yeah. uh, and I'm I'm really interested to, to know what other trees there are that are attractive to bees because they're a, a huge, I would say, source. <coughs> one one tree is probably the huge source of pollen and nectar and um, yeah. And wondering, like red maple also blooms early. Right, right. Like, have you looked at all yes. those early blooms? So, and excellent right. question, and something I meant to bring up in the talk is that in the spring it's all trees and shrubs, right before June first. And I know about willow <laughs> and blueberry and some other things, but I actually last year got a drone to help to figure out what's visiting trees mm -hmm. early in the season. So stay tuned, but my focus in the spring, I mentioned the nesting, but it's figuring out what species are using as a source of nectar and pollen in the spring past willow. And you know, multiple species of willow, you can get from, from before snow melt all the way through to June with willow species alone, you pick the right ones. And so I'm, I'm gonna set up habitats like that to see if it helps, but yeah, I need more data. So. If you have a drone and you want to participate, <laughs> or you like to climb trees uh, and take videos of bees, but yeah, that's that's an area. It's all trees and shrubs. So the the, the the pollinator habitats, right? They come in June and then they peak in July, but things aren't going to make it that far. So we really need to focus in the spring. When I mentioned everything's happening in the spring, that's that's what I was getting at. I forgot to mention is that I need more data on trees and shrubs, which is supplying nectar and pollen in the spring. Yes. Are there um, many species of willow? I, I mean, yes. I know there are, but um, ones that would be native to here? Yes. Yes, multiple species. And so there, the weeping willow, but then... Pussy willow. Pussy there's, uh, there, there are tons. I, I, they're all on the back list if you send them to me. Okay. Um, now, the next question, in case you're wondering, where do we get this stuff? Right? So I'm working with nurseries to try to get them and Freddie's doing a lot in this regard as well, but across the state, picking nurseries to try to get the plants that are critical for these threatened species, because mm -hmm. uh, often they're not available. Uh, willow is one. There's a place in Vermont that will sell any type of willow, but that's mm -hmm. the only place I can find. So I want to start something here in Massachusetts where they would supply the willow and have species that would bloom consecutively and provide that component for that much. The Patriots game started, so please <laughs> Right. 
just do your property. I think it's the Middlesex Mosquito Control. There's different mosquito control districts. So I don't I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just saying it's it's if it is true, then it negates some of the others. But I don't know. Yes. I think it's more. I mean, I think the state does it in many. Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple places. So we're we're getting to the end of our time. I see Liz, you had your. I'll take one last question, okay? And then so so there's been a concept that if you could just transform 50 percent of your lawn to native something. Yeah. That this is going to have a difference. Do you have any sense of how fast that makes a difference? If everybody did it, it would be fairly rapid, I would guess. If you're depending on what is again, it's what you put in there. That's the question. So the incentives in Minnesota, I mentioned that that plan list they have isn't going to help anything. So if you put in the if you put in the right, if everybody in Southwell, for example, put in the right things, I do feel that it would have an almost immediate positive impact. Like in a season? Yeah. You wow. Well, if the bees are here and they have everything they need, they're going to that's going to keep them going. If they have if they do well at those particular times, they would the population would increase. So right now it's stable or declining. If you give them what they need, it'll it'll keep this keep it stable or increase depending on the species. So I do feel that in creating these pollinator corridors, if you choose the right plants, you can help to to spread. So if the species is here, that's the first step. And then you want to pull it into areas where you don't see it. And by doing plantings along these corridors, you can create these habitats. And I do, I mean, I've seen it, and I I do feel that yes, we can have a fairly rapid increase within a couple of seasons for sure. So thank you all for coming on behalf of the Native Pollinator Task Force of the Metro West Conservation Alliance. You're going to hear more from us. That's why we wanted to capture your email. We hope you'll stay involved. It's really encouraging that so many people came. Some of you drove a bigger distance. One of the things we're also thinking about next winter is maybe having like a what's the word? And like a movie. Film fest. You know, maybe how we're going to spread how we're going to spread this message throughout 36 communities. And for that, you are our ambassadors. And we're hoping you're going to be involved in other workshops and events we have, particularly this how-to. Rob is giving us um, a lot of information we'll hope to incorporate, not hope to, but I plan to incorporate into any of the information we give out. It's not one size fits all. And I will say, when you were talking about the Pussy Willow and how fast you can transform, at Breakneck Hill, and I also want to say, and I have a few of the other members, the uh, Stewardship Committee had a lot to do with it. It wasn't all just me. So we had a lot of people working and supporting Rob's efforts, and a lot of people helping with ecology. But we chose a section not to mow. And then we looked what came in the next year, and there was some pussy willow. So the next year, we flagged that. We just spent a couple hours out there the other day flagging special plants Rob likes. Thank you. And um, <laughs> you know, roses, native roses, and the pussy willow. And then they don't get mowed next year, so they're there. And we found in one year a difference of how many queens were there by not mowing. But you don't know if you mow every, and we thought we were doing a good job, right? We mowed it all, but now you have the invasives come in. So there's always something for management. And um, you have a question? Well, I just would say that if you're managing pussy willow, it will grow incredibly well just from cuttings. So if you're just cutting it back, bundle it up and give it to people right. that are looking for it, because it is an most willow will grow incredibly well just from cutting. Right, that's an excellent point. And I, 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 if we had to start a willow group, because that's what they do in Vermont, and yes, that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah, we use it to buy restoration jobs. Yes. So we harvest it and plant it right on the ground and it does very well. Yeah, that, that, that would be good to get that going. And the same thing, I've done the same thing in Western Mass, telling them not to mow, and I saw a bomb was trickling the threatened species immediately. It was the first one on the planet, so it's definitely so fill out your surveys. Do we have a place to collect them? 
There's a bin in the table. There's a up bin there. in the other room. Please drop it off before you go. Add any other notes, and if you want to talk to someone at the end, see one of the task forces. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Again.